All right, you know what? Let's uh, let's kick this off. Let's get it started. So, uh, welcome everyone to the uh, to the June edition of the Vancouver Power BI Modern Excel and uh, Power BI and Modern Excel User Group. This is our uh, Power BI track for the month. Uh, we're excited to be welcoming uh, Daniel Hughes for our presentation today. But before we get into that, let's just go through and uh, do our regular housekeeping bit that we always start with. So. Uh, we have had a little bit of chatting going on here before this started. Uh, we're now at the top of the hour, and I'm just going to do a quick intro for a couple minutes. Before we hand it over, uh, super excited to have Yana Berkovich back doing a pinch hitter for us on the what's new in Power BI, uh, because unfortunately, uh, Joseph had to uh, pull out last minute. He's, uh, he's under the weather, so um, we are hoping that he gets better uh, better quick. But uh, thanks uh, hugely, Yana, for uh, for coming to visit us. He is in the uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands right now, coming long distance back to uh, to the user group. So we really really appreciate that. Um, I do want to say a big thanks to uh, to the sponsors that make this event possible, uh, Excel Guru, my company, for uh, organizing all the speakers and uh, and making those last minute calls to make sure that we actually have someone that does uh, does need or can speak for us at, on uh, on occasions here. Uh, Skillwave Training, which is our training division where we uh, where we focus on uh, awesome Excel and Power BI learning. We've got a whole bunch of new stuff going on over there. I should definitely check that out for some great content. Uh, Microsoft for helping us out uh, in many, many ways for the software that we actually use tonight. Uh, our feature speaker tonight, of course, is now a Microsoft employee, even though she was one of us once, but we missed her for that, but that's all good. Um, and the final thing that I want to throw out there as well is just a, a quick shout out to uh, to the Monkey Tools add-in, which is a an add-in to help you build Excel and Power BI models after and better. Um, one of the things that I do want to just main mention on this, I know I mentioned this in the uh, last Excel meetup, uh, but uh, one of the features that we just actually announced with Monkey Tools is that we can now go and import your models from Power BI back into Excel. It is no longer a one-way street from Excel to Power BI. We can bring them back the other direction. So if you are a person like me who likes to actually do a lot of work in Excel and you inherit a Power BI model, there is now a way to get it back into the place where you may want to work with it. So uh, you can check out on on Reed Haven's webcast here, a full demo of, uh, of the stuff that we were actually working around with, playing around with a lot of different things in Monkey Tools, as well as where we actually announced that new feature. Um, this was uh, just, uh, just about a month ago now. So um, it's a cool new thing that we've got out there. Our next meetups that are coming up, um, I will be taking on the next meetup in the Excel track. I'm going to be talking about creating unpivotable charts in Excel. Uh, this is one of those things that we can do a lot of awesome things with the data model in Excel, but one of the things we can't do is create some of the cool different charts out there like waterfall charts against the data model. You try and do that and it says, I'm sorry, but pivot type or charts don't support this kind of format. So I'm going to show you how we can. Um, and there's a couple of different routes to go through that. So that's what that uh, session is going to be about, is looking at some different chart types. And then I'm excited to be uh, welcoming uh, one of my friends and partners, um, Matt Allington, is going to be coming to talk about thinking about DAX differently. That is going to be our next Power BI track, which is going to be on Thursday, July 22nd. Uh, the meetup slots are open, so please uh, don't forget to register for both of these sessions. If you are interested in taking a slot uh, speaking here, uh, like our feature speaker today, who's brand new to us, uh, if you're interested in these, please fill out the survey here. We would love to have new speakers. Welcome them all the time when we can. Um, so we'd definitely like to hear from you. Fill out the survey. We'll get in touch, and we'll get you uh, to come and uh, take part in our platform. Now, um, I'm two minutes early on my five-minute intro slot, but I think that just gives us more time to hear from uh, from Yana. So what we're going to do is, Yana, do you want to take over the screen and, uh, and, and show us what's new in Power BI? I would love to do that. So awesome. give me a second. I'm working with one, one monitor here, so uh, please be patient. If, and That's please don't tell if any visit. Microsoft information <laughs> is exposed. Awesome. Uh, once again, Yana, thanks for doing this uh, last minute. Um, as I say, this is a, this is a huge thing, and uh, it, it always blows me away when I can email Yana and say, "Are you able on super short notice to do this?" She goes, "Of course." I'm like, are you nuts? Um, so we love you. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. I'm going to kick the floor over you. It's all yours. Thank you so much, Ken. I love uh, being in Vancouver, uh, even if it's just virtually. So uh, today I will be doing um, hopefully slow what's new and exciting with Power BI. Usually I speak very, very fast, but I was teaching for the last week and this was the first and last feedback that I've got, just slow down. So I will try. 
Uh, so I'm Jana Berkovic. I'm in US Virgin Islands right now, and this is how it looks like. Well, not today, because today is raining, but usually this is how it looks like. I'm a pro uh, program manager for instructor-led training in my at Microsoft, and I was a data platform MVP for three years and was exciting to cooperate in the Vancouver and other Power BI user groups uh, across the world. Uh, my LinkedIn profile and Twitter handler are here. I would love uh, to hear from you, uh, and also I'm always publishing uh, a power platform related stuff. So if it is uh, interesting, I uh, would love to keep in touch. Uh, so what am I doing? I'm doing instructor led training, which means the Power BI training. This is the uh, one minute of commercials if I'm here and I'm with Microsoft, so I'm supposed to do the commercials to what we actually do. So you can download the Power BI training in the aka.ms BBI training and train. So if you are instructors, if you are trainers, if you are partner Microsoft partners or MVPs, you are more than welcome to go ahead, download, create your own paid session with our content that we supply, provide and uh, maintain for you. And uh, all the information are in the pages that below that you can see uh, linked here. Uh, I, I wanted also to emphasize something uh, here. So this is our Power BI instructor -led training page. Uh, those are all the Power BI trainings that are available for you. So for example, that's in a day, not yet. It's going to be uh, very, very shortly uh, during the hopefully at the, the end of the summer. And uh, advanced data modeling and shaping is very popular training and so on. So please go ahead, download, train and create your sessions. Even guy in a cube that in today's uh, well, who likes who doesn't like free Power BI training uh, mentioned us for quite extensively. So uh, uh, go ahead and watch those three, three minutes and you will know how to learn Power BI uh, from learn and from a uh, instructor training and other uh, sources. So um, it is also in the presentation that uh, uh, will be available probably uh, via the meetup site uh, with Ken. Okay, let's get back to the presentation today and think about what's new and exciting uh, in Power BI and not just in training. So, um, uh, okay, so first of all, we've got the uh, become more productive, analyze you and your organization activity in teams. So right now you can um, add more than just uh, the teams tab into the Power BI tab into teams. Uh, you can add um, all the, uh, you can add many more capabilities <laughs> inside teams for Power BI. Uh, so there's a whole new bar with new action items just for Power BI in teams. Uh, it contains, for example, goals, and we will talk about goals a little more in the very near future. It has applications the, and other deploy, deployment pipeline, workspaces, and even access to learning center uh, for Power BI and much more. As you can see, I've copied the bar right here. We'll see it in Teams in a few seconds. And um, I will get out of the PowerPoint so we can see it in Teams as well. And probably all those things are very familiar to you from your uh, from your uh, usual Power BI stuff, Power BI thing. So this is my teams in Microsoft. This is why I am not going to open uh, everything here and explore all the tabs. But uh, how did I get to this screen? Uh, I have gone here and from this uh, list I found the Power BI and I have added it right here. So now I have the Power BI icon on this uh, on this navigation. And uh, right here, uh, I have the Teams and Activity Analysis uh, Analytics, and this is my activity. So you can see the last 31 days, uh, how many audio and video calls I've had, how many participation, uh, how participated I was, how many chats and I have done. And it's very interesting to see. We have also, uh, you can also do it with the correlation to your Office 365 uh, a activity monitoring that can be also in your uh, uh, Office 365 portal and you can see where are the hours that you are resting, hours that you're more active, hours that you are uh, doing other stuff and uh, you can also analyze how uh, how uh, productive you are and improve your productivity or maybe uh, improve your rest time because if you are working until 2 a.m. yesterday and starting today at 8 a.m. meaning 7.30 you need to wake up, uh, that's not and then at 9 p.m. you are still doing something. Maybe just maybe you need to slow down and go to the beach, but not me. Uh, 
So uh, you also have the team activity, but I will not show you this uh, and also team activity details. This is going to be for specific teams, so you need to know how active your team is and draw the conclusions uh, accordingly. So I do hope that you'll use this uh, in those new. Uh, you can create new uh, create an, uh, um, manually enter data or pick um, publish data set. The same thing that you can create on Power BI service. So basically you are working with Power BI, but you are working on uh, the Teams applications. Another very great thing is the learn, of course, and the deployment pipeline. Deployment pipelines, I hope that Joseph uh, talked to you about that uh, last month, and there'll probably be uh, months ahead when you can uh, explore more with this wonderful feature and things that will go ahead and be uh, more new and new and exciting there. Alrighty, so let's get back to the presentation. OK, this one is that uh, teams activity. Uh, you cannot see the team's name because uh, um, I did not want to expose the team's names themselves, but you can see how many things this team's activity with using with uh, power behind BI, uh, BI behind the scenes gives you. You have all the live users, you have all the engagements, uh, last uh, messages of in the past 40 days. And so this is one of the columns that is hidden, total posts, total replies. And you can know, for example, the first team here, even though it has um, um, it has about postal replies or uh, 90 days and 89 days, maybe the governance policy for this specific teams need to be that after 90 days that nobody posts in the team. And uh, you can again compare this data with the data that you have got in your Office 365 uh, monitoring center and see if this team might be deprecated and is no longer needed. So uh, if you've noticed, I hope you didn't, but in my team's tenant, there are many, 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 many teams and it's sometimes hard to follow and there were even 13 messages that I haven't even read yet from all those teams and other things. So um, all this information uh, uh, is uh, uh, cluttering uh, our desktop, is cluttering our teams and uh, there might be a policy that can help us to um, be more productive and more uh, effective. So speaking of goals, goals was something that was huge in the last business application summit. It was presented by Justina Luchuk from uh, the Power BI product team. Uh, this is an example of goal setting. So first of all, how do we create the scorecard? We are creating the scorecard again. We can create it just from teams um, creating those uh, or we create it, can create it in Power BI. So for example, I have created a scorecard that calls test ILT, test instructor led training. I do can create another workspace or use an existing one. I and uh, one and one thing it does need a premium workspace because it has the AI feature on the, uh, below that is uh, driving it. Uh, but it has a very, very important thing. It has got a sensitivity label. Sensitivity label is something that is being added to many Power BI reports and many da and data in generally. And it is enabling two things. First of all, it's in information security. If it is has to stay inside the organization or it is a non-business or it is something else, uh, or it is a highly sensitive level one, two, three, five, every organization defines the sensitivity label in a certain way. Another thing is privacy because here we have goals, so goals can be private goals as well. So, for example, I want to improve my uh, performance, so I want to improve my rest time or something like that, and, or I want to uh, improve the time it takes me to answer new team calls or the time it takes me to answer an email for a client. So all of this is very, very personal. I probably wouldn't like to somebody to present it in some kind of a conference afterwards with my name on it and so on. And with goals, you have we have several things so we have got the name of the goal we have the status and we have the value that is given and it's all uh, things that can be defined and of course the progress if we are progressing towards the goals or we are progressing backwards and uh, we can measure uh, everything that is um, about the about our data. Now, uh, important thing that it's kind of reminded of dashboards and things that we are doing in advanced data visualizations for dashboards. Uh, so just um, take a very close look at goals and uh, see how you are, can work better with this. Um, all right. 
uh, embedded analytics. Embedded analytics, for those of you who forgot what it is, you can add it to your web application. That means you have a web application. You can embed analytics inside the web application. So end-to-end -end flow of all required Power BI REST APIs is now available, and it's available in .NET Core, uh, Java, and Python. So there is a lot of availability right now. Uh, you can add it uh, in the web application, and this is what exactly this is um, describing. Uh, in the GitHub, Hub. You can also see uh, this uh, environment and how to work here with it and uh, sample tutorials. Uh, something that I wanted to emphasize is this page. This is a wonderful page that was prepared by Amit Schuster and it's also linked in your uh, in your presentation. In this page, it basically explains you can download the video or watch the video. Uh, you can download the slides of the presentation, download the transcript and explore deeper, co content, deeper content and training. So at the end of the day, from this video, from this place, you can explore everything you need to know about the new uh, embedded analytics and how to work with it. There is also a demo site, so I encourage you to go ahead and leverage this uh, wonderful resource that you have got. Um, okay, and this is what happens when I speak slow. I get run out of time. So, um, okay, so what uh, else? This is the exciting part. I almost didn't notice it, and it was kind of under the radar, but uh, Salesforce and Power BI, now you can embed Power BI report, dashboard, and more in Salesforce. So uh, we talked about embedded analytics a second ago. Uh, so you can now do this embedding also in Salesforce sites, just like you do it in SharePoint sites, which is kind of awesome and uh, opens a lot of opportunities um, for Salesforce users to enjoy Power BI as well, and vice versa for Power BI users to enjoy Salesforce. Um, no comments about competition or non-competition. You will not catch me on that. Uh, new data gateway. So this is the time of the year to install your data gateways again. So please go ahead, install the new and exciting data gateway. And uh, now uh, we have got also support for single sign-on for both SQL Server and Oracle data sources through Power BI Enterprise Data Gateway. Uh, and this is huge because before that we had mostly for SQL Server and uh, we had um, a few different ways to configure that. So it uh, and now you have uh, single sign-on support. So uh, go ahead, take an advantage of it. It improves the security. And why are we doing that every uh, couple of months? We renew in the data gateway because we want to support the logic uh, that the same query execution run, uh, runtime logic in um, uh, is going to happen in the Power BI desktop version and in your gateway. So go ahead, download the gateway. It's a couple of minutes work. And uh, I know about the enterprise provisioning of the gateway. This is an idea. Please go for the idea site in Power BI. A community and vote for ideas that are important to you. Power BI Windows app. We have the Power BI phone app, but we also now have the Power BI Windows app that is available for those users who do not want or cannot um, uh, or cannot install the Power BI on their specific machine. So the Windows app is uh, for business users that can uh, work on their Windows with the uh, Power BI application, similarly to what they would have worked on their mobile phone. So now you can change the layout, you can add all the uh, frequent reports, and you can see all your uh, apps, and you can see and so much more. As you can see, the Power BI uh, navigation right here on the left side is also available here, just like in Teams. Uh, additional updates, Power BI Report Builder. Uh, this is a, a way to for you to create uh, the, the paginated uh, report. Uh, has done two things. So first of all, it is now available in the Microsoft Store, not just for a separate download. And also it had added a data label. So you have got a, all a data ribbon, a, including the Azure Synapse, uh, which is uh, instead of a, a, a Data, SQL Data Warehouse uh, in Azure. And of course, the Dataverse. Dataverse, for those of you who want to learn, this is the uh, basics on which Power BI, Power Apps, and the rest of the Power Platform is standing. This is the database uh, that stores the data uh, on, 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 uh, in the background of the Power Platform. So 
this is new and exciting for us. And a uh, sentence I did not know where to put in my presentation, but it's still an additional update that it's important to remember. Email notifications for non-owners of data flows. Before that, only owner of a data flow could get a minimum notification if the data flow is failing, if something happened, if uh, the data flow is overloaded, and other things that are related to the data flow performance and um, execution. Right now, non-owners can do that as well. So you can be a system uh, um, system administrator or uh, Power BI administrator and get those notifications. Uh, so uh, it is important. So Business Application Summit recap, my 25 to 27th. Um, it was uh, under the signing of empowering every individual and empower every team and empower every organization. So basically this is the statement and this is the goal uh, to empower each individual. And uh, I think that uh, this slide was important for me to show, not just to show the recaps and where you can find them in our Power BI blog and what new and exciting features such as smart narrative general available, uh, anomaly detection general available. And I did a talk in data minutes just last week about anomaly detection and it was awesome uh, or how to do anomaly detection in 10 minutes this was fast and uh there are um, um there are many other features like med data says discoverable uh, discoverable and accessible it is a uh, coming up it is uh, connecting to what i'm doing right here in the us virgin island because what i'm doing i'm basically empowering individuals to do more uh, with data to do more with a uh, uh, ability to create their applications and to improve basically the way they are interacting uh, with technology and uh, how they are able to create new and exciting solutions uh, for themselves for their community for their team and for their organization so i'm um, very happy to be part of it um i don't have the time to review the anomaly detection as well and as the uh, administration updates so there is a uh, update for workspace admins that are uh, that are changing uh, update work workspace tools and uh, there are other a automatic upgrades for basic workspace. So those two things uh, we haven't reviewed in details, and I hope that you'll find the chance to play a little bit with anomaly detection. It's fun and it's very easy to um, add to your Power BI uh, solution. Okay, Ken. Ken? Yes? Anybody? <laughs> you want to see a, a, hear about anomaly detection, or we can hand it over to our no, presenters? No, <laughs> I think we're going to need to hand it over to our presenter. Uh, yes. Yana, thank you for uh, for that uh, that run through thank again. Uh, one question though, that we did have come into the chat regarding the Power yes. BI Windows app: Is it yes. possible for the dashboard app link that's shared with other users directly to open in the Power BI Windows app rather than a browser if the Power BI Windows app is available on the laptop? Now, I don't know if you're going to know the answer to that question, but I'll bet you, you probably know somebody who would be able to actually get that fixed if it doesn't do it already. Yes, that's that's uh, that, that's an interesting question that might uh, stuck on the fact that it is the same user that is uh, connected to both machines and it will flag uh, before even the application. So it really is depends on that. And also if you pu published your Power BI report as a report and not trying to access it as a dashboard, it also depends. All right, there you go. Cool. Um, thank you once again for uh, for coming in and pitch hitting for us. We really appreciate it, Yana. Um, it's always awesome to have you with us and uh, and taking time out of your uh, out of your evening there. I know you uh, you ended up skipping a dinner with the team, so um, thank you uh, once again. Thank you say, for keeping my enough. diet. The food here is amazing. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that was what it was all about for sure. <laughs> At any rate, um, have a great one, bud. I'm sure you probably end have to end up going again. Thank you hugely for this, and we will uh, we will catch you again, Yana. Um, always awesome to have you with us. Uh, on that note, um, I think it is time to hand it over to our presenter. So, uh, Daniel, are you ready? I am. I am ready. Fantastic. In that case, um, you know, the screen, the floor is yours, and uh, I'm going to just mute myself and let you take it away. Perfect. Sounds good. I appreciate uh, you inviting me today. So my name is Daniel Hughes with Process Analytics Factory. I'm also joined today by Robert Connolly, who is one of our North American data analysts. And Robert is actually going to do a lot of the demonstrating today. Live, live software in Power BI to show you how to do process finding. Um, 
what I wanted to start with, though, is, you know, Robert and I do one of these, two of these a week, <laughs> Power BI Users Group. Uh, I guess that is one of the uh, good things about COVID is everybody's virtual now, so we can do these from anywhere in the world. Uh, today, I'm in Texas, and Robert is in Michigan to do this. Um, so usually when we do these, um, most people in the Power BI user group don't know what process mining is. So I'm going to start with a little bit of background on what is process mining, um, a little bit about the capabilities uh, around the way Gartner defines that, and then talk a little bit more about uh, use cases. And then we'll turn it over to Robert to walk you through what that looks like. And then if you stick around all the way to the end, I'll give you a link where you can download the software and start process mining for free inside of Power BI. So a little teaser for you to uh, to make it all the way to the end. Let me share my screen, make sure I get the right one here. That should work. Move everybody over there. So let's, let's talk about process mining. So, so process mining is an analytical um, discipline that attempts not to show you the KPIs or what's happening in your organization, but attempts to show you why your KPIs are what they are based on the underlying process data. So the technology attempts to recreate or reverse engineer a business process based on the data that lives inside of your, your ERP or your transactional systems. So it takes the data from those transactional systems on how each transaction of a process was executed and then uses that to build a map of your process that looks very similar to, to what you see here on the screen. That map it tells you a lot of different things. It tells you how a transaction went from start to finish in your process. It tells you how long it took you to complete your process. It can tell you how long it took you to complete every step in your process. And it can actually then tell you, do you have transactions that are outside of the norm or outside of your prescribed process? So by doing that, it'll show you Hey, I have a KPI, let's say, of um, I want to have 50 day sales outstanding is my goal. My day sales outstanding is 75. Um, so why? What is my process? What inside of my process is causing that? And the way the data that we need to go and build this is really pretty simple and straightforward. Um, we simply need an audit log from your ERP or your transactional system that includes three pieces of data. The first thing that we need is an activity name. So we need a name of all the steps in your process that happened. And it doesn't matter if that process is order to cash or procure to pay or plan to deliver. You give us the name of the steps and we'll be able to reverse engineer that process. So first set of data is the step name. The second thing we need is the timestamp. We need to know when did that step happen. And then finally, we need a unique case ID. We need some number, a transaction ID, that we can use to track a, a transaction from the start to the end of the process, either inside of one system or potentially across many systems. So with only those three pieces of data, the process mining software will take that data and create the process map that you're looking at here. Now, that's just the basics, right? That's what you want to do. Um, that's the basics of process mining. There's a lot of other things that people want to do. Um, they might want to compare side by side the processes plant to plant or country to country or vendor or customer to customer. Um, they might want to determine um, places for automation inside of their process. What are the bottlenecks in my process that I could automate with Power Apps or with Power Automate? Um, they might even want to do things like look at um, um, auditing, internal auditing to find violations of internal controls or segregation of duties errors. To do that, 
we simply add to our audit log attributes that we want to report against. So if we want to compare plant to plant, we add plant, <laughs> plant ID to our data set. If we want to compare um, employee to employee, we call that resource. We add a resource ID to our data set. If we're looking at uh, segregation of duties errors, we use resources for that. And if we want to look at, um, you know, vendors or our, our large invoices causing us problems in our process, we could add invoice amount, we could add PO amount, we could add vendor name, we could have country or uh, customer or even delivery country. So all data that's found inside of your ERP system, we add that um, as attributes into the audit log. Um, so from there, we load that audit log into Power BI and um, our data transformation creates a whole series of measures that we use to then report against. And we do that because of the capabilities that Gartner has defined for process mining. Process mining is about uh, 15 to 20 year old, uh, actually probably a little less than that, probably 10 to 15 year old discipline that was born out of Germany, out of uh, Eindhoven University in Germany. And the students there created process mining companies in Germany, and they've since spread across the world. Um, it seems like to me the last place that's picking it up is the United States and uh, ahead of that actually is Canada and we have quite a few customers in Canada. Uh, but Gartner picked it up in 2018 and in 2020 and released their pro market guide for process mining that laid out a series of capabilities or set of capabilities that process mining vendors should have to be a complete process mining solution. Um, it started with automated process discovery 10 or 15 years ago, taking that audit log, feeding it into the algorithm, getting that process map was all anybody did with it. But now to be a complete process mining platform, you need to have conformance checking or the ability to define a, um, a process um, so a way you would like to execute your process and be able to compare um, every transaction against that conforming process. You need to be able to do data prep. You need to be able to capture data, not from a single system, but across multiple systems. You need to be able to have real-time dashboards to, to be able to monitor the process um, in real time based on the data. Uh, process model enhancement, the ability to add a 2B process once you've identified the as is with process mining to say, hey, I want to enhance that process and define what I want it to look like tomorrow. The ability to interact with have multiple processes interact together. So um, we do a lot of work in supply chain and supply chain goes across uh, procure to pay and order to cash because you need to get your 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 inventory so that you can create the product so that you can deliver it to your customer. So the ability to take those processes that are separate in your ERP system and visualize to those together is really new. And then customer journeys is one of the latest places that that process mining is going. Um, and the reason that it's it, it hasn't been tackled before is because of how complex it is. You know, Robert and I just recently did a project with a uh, B to C um, hardware manufacturer, where we looked at the customer journey across their websites and tried to identify what customer journey path through their systems would lead to um, the best outcomes or conversions at the end is what they called it. And what we found across their customer journey was there were over 850,000 process variants or ways that their customers took across their processes or across their um, websites. So the ability to take all of that data and visualize it is um, is not the easiest thing in the world. And it's one, one of the reasons Gardner has called it out here. Um, predictive prescriptive analysis. Um, so using um, AI and machine learning to identify what would happen next. Um, in your process to predict what the next step is, to prescribe what actions you might be able to take if a transaction 
veers off of the prescribed pass path, and then actually being able to take action on that. Um, so once you identify that, hey, this this transaction is going to be late, our, our delivery time is now pushed. Um, we have a bottleneck with this uh, supplier in Taiwan. Can we automatically take action on that? Um, and then task mining is actually recording what happens on the desktop, recording what the user does to interact with the application and even to interact with applications that aren't the ERP system and adding that into the process map. And at Path Now, in order to um, be able to do all of this, we've chosen to partner with Microsoft and Power BI and build all of our process mining into Power BI because of the ability to access hundreds of, of systems and data from, from hundreds of systems to take advantage of everything in Azure um, for machine learning and IoT um, and, and data manipulation. And then even the Power Automate um, to be able to take action and to, to record users' desktops um, through the uh, process advisor in Power Automate to add task mining to the tool. And doing that has led to incredible growth for us. We're growing over 200% a year, um, adding customers and customers every day. And that, by embedding all of our process mining in Power BI, in the Power Platform, allows us to take advantage of, as we all know here, the Gartner's market-leading um, data and analytics tool in Power BI. So that's a little bit about process mining. Um, I didn't see any questions in the chat. If not, I will uh, turn it over to Robert and let him dive um, into a full demo of, of the tool, to show you exactly how it works, um, show you how you can load data, and then we'll come back and uh, I'll give you a link to go and download it for free. All right, I'll take over. Thanks, Daniel. All right, uh, so my name is Robert Connolly. I am again a North American data analyst. I work with Daniel and Jenny at Power, or sorry, at Path Now. Um, and I will be doing the demo today for uh, looking our software in Power BI and process mining. Um, so the first page that you'll see here is a standard thing we like to do, and it's the discovery page. Um, process mining often begins with just looking at your process. Um, you need to know what's happening in a general sense before you can really dive in. So the first page is just about beginning that analysis by looking at the overall process. Um, in this case, I'm using a purchase to pay or procurement um, data set. So we start with the create purchase order, go through some approval levels, post because receipt, post invoice, and pay an invoice. Uh, that's what our standard company process is. Um, and one way we could actually find out if that's that is the standard company process is that we can look over here in the variant section. Um, so what a variant is is actually one way that your process happens. So one one flow of steps from beginning to end. And I'll show you what that means. So if I click our most common variant here, number one, which happens in 471 cases, it goes exactly as I just said: purchase order, approval levels. Uh, goods receipt, post invoice, and pay invoice. Now, a new variant, if I click on variant number two, is now we see that we actually skip some approval levels uh, in our process flows sometimes. So, depending on what your company may define, um, you may have your most common variant as your uh, your standard process. This is the one we want to see every time, barring some some restrictions, maybe maybe not. OK, um, and then how we determine where we're maybe having bottlenecks, uh, where we need to look at our process, we're going to use just simple color coding. So this is something we do uh, with the process explorer here. That's what this visual is called for process mining. And you'll see anywhere you have bright red, uh, it's just automatically highlighted. Um, this can be configured, but right now it's default set up to be um, your lead times or your cycle times, whichever word you prefer. And basically, you just see how long it took to go from one activity to another. Um, in this case, you're seeing that post invoice to pay invoice is taking the longest time on average. 
Um, this is telling you it took on average 12 days and 16 hours to go between these two. It's not saying that in only one case it did that. If you wanted to do that and find case by case, um, I, I'll show you things differently later that will allow you to do things like that. Um, but one way you can actually narrow down what you're looking at uh, with the process explorer is if you decide there's a certain variant or process flow that you're interested in, for example, you see that, okay, when I skip my approval levels, it actually takes 11 days on average. Um, and we can see that even with the intermediary, intermediary steps here, it doesn't take 11 days when you add those all up. It only takes about three days and you know four hours. So why is this happening potentially? Uh, something we can do to only look at variants that include this edge is I can right click it and include it. Um, and this is a really big piece of process mining is being able to filter down into the process you want to know more about uh, because it's great to see your process overall, but the end goal is to increase efficiency in the end. So uh, it's always really handy to just be able to filter down even more. And that's one way that process mining can filter down your data. Um, so now I'm just looking at only the cases and only the variants that go through that edge and skip over the other approval steps. Um, so we see we have 23 variants that do that and 234 cases. Up here on the top left, anytime I make a uh, selection in my data, so if I was to right click this, um, by the way, this arrow that loops here, this is a self loop indicator. It's telling you that in your process, sometimes you go from approve PO level one right back to approve PO level one as the next step. It just doesn't show it as a separate node. It puts this here. So I can right click and exclude. So now I only want to see those cases that don't have a self loop on approved PO level one. And up here, you're going to start noticing these different buttons. So the red button here is if I want to get rid of my exclusionary filters, and I can put more than one, but right now I've just got one. And if I do that, we'll go back to our 23 variants. Um, and then here you'll see my inclusion uh, variants. And if you want to get rid of both of them at the same time, so let me click exclude, you can just go over here and press that. And I'll do that to reset our data. So yeah, that's the beginning of process finding. It's really important to just have an overview of what your process actually looks like. Um, if I use the slider on the bottom, you'll see all the different variants start to appear. If I grab it and move it over, you'll see our less common variants, which is going to cause a little bit of what I like to call spaghettification, um, but really it's just makes your process get a little uh, hectic. So that's why it's important to narrow down what you want to actually look at a lot of the time. Um, down here, we always include a case overview table. We just leverage bookmarks in Power BI to uh, give you a case overview table. So what this is, is you make a selection of data. So if I include this again, um, and then you come here and you'll look at actually the cases that you have now selected in your data. Uh, this is just nice to know what maybe time periods you're looking at, um, how many steps are included in these, and then what the lead times are like for all these. So as you can see, we have one, our case number one, that takes 400 days. So we've already found maybe an outlier. So we could look at that if we wanted to, but I'm probably going to not do that at the moment. All right, so one last thing I want to show here. Um, something really nice about Power BI that I'm sure you are all somewhat familiar with, but something that's really good for um, process mining actually is when you've filtered down to a variant, we like to put a drill through button, which is pretty standard, just to drill through and you right click. And we use this so that you can carry over all of those cases that you're looking at and all those filters to another page so you can continue your process mining somewhere else. Um, so I'll do that on the monitoring page real quick. Let me find it in here. Oh, it's on the top. OK, so monitoring. Um, here are some unique things about process mining uh, that any process would have as a KPI. So the way we do this, I have this is a standard report I'm showing. So none of this is going to be specific to procurement. Um, this is just process KPIs. And with Path Now, we, we generally include this page with these. They're just standard. Um, but if you're interested in knowing about what is important in a process, uh, just as a general sense and with process mining, you can look at a couple of these things. And one is unique variants. Um, unique variants are when your process happens, one process flow happens one time. So basically, if I was to cut out all my approval levels and not have any approval levels, 
that only happened one time over all my years of data, that would be a unique variant because the, that specific process flow only happened once. Um, cases with self loops is fairly explanatory or self explanatory, um, but basically that's any case that has a loop from one step right back to the same step. Automation rate is just going to be how many of your steps are automated in your cases. Um, so in this case, we can see that we had a spike at some point and then it went down. This is just going monthly data. So uh, you can see that we've got 9-1-2014 and then it goes all the way to 4-1-2015. Um, here we have a cases with long lead time KPI. Basically, it's a predetermined um, bucket group that we make. So it's just a measure uh, in Power BI or it might be in our transformation. I'd have to look. Uh, but basically, you just take your all your lead times, you find out, OK, what's my, you know, what's my normal distribution? Where are the most of them lying? And then where are the outliers? And we just make buckets based off of that. And those that are on the really high buckets count as cases with long lead times. So you'd just be interested to know how many more are we adding every week or every month, I should say. Um, cases with many process steps, again, self-explanatory. The more steps you have, the more uh, you would count them as cases with many process steps. And number of resources per process step, this is just taking a look at how many people, bots, or different resources it takes to um, accomplish one process step or a case. I'll go to the next page. So now I'm looking at the difference analysis. And something that's really, really important with process mining is what we call process drift. Uh, process drift is how your process changes over time. So if I was to select 2012 and 2015, now you'll notice we have a legend feature on the Process Explorer. And when you see the green, it's going to be 2012. And when you see yellow, it'll be 2015. So if I bring this out a little bit, what you'll notice is that in 2012, we never once uh, did this thing, which is create shopping cart. Um, essentially, it's probably just similar to create purchase re requisition, um, but maybe it's a little different. Uh, for whatever reason, but in 2015, we see we've added a new step and we count this as process drift because we are changing our process over time. And this is obviously very common for any pro uh, for any process at any company. You want it to change over time to fit new norms and to become more efficient. Um, so this is just one way of looking at it is to use some filter, find your uh, your years and then use the process explorer to then look at the years comparatively and see what's changed over time. And obviously you can put the ones in between um, if you would like. So let me go back to selecting them all. And I just want to show real quick that there's actually a few different layouts you can use here. Um, and it's really, it's they're all very useful in their own ways. So when we're looking at process drift, it's really nice to use uh, what we call the unique highlight where we just see specific edges and nodes are highlighted by their year. Um, but what you can also do is, let me actually bring this down a little bit, do a side by side. So now we're separating the years uh, side by side. So we see 2012, 2013, 2014, and 2015. And now you're just seeing the process year by year. And again, you can use this for process drift, um, but this is actually really useful for all different kinds of attributes because not only can we obviously go by um, year, we could also go by potentially like our purchasing organization, um, maybe you have a department within your company that handles specific regions. And if you, you had that as an attribute, you could compare those right here um, and just see side by side how they look. So let's go to benchmarking. And I'm actually going to show another way to do exactly what I just said about comparing side by side. So on this page, we've made it. We've leveraged Power BI so that only, um, sorry, on the left side, the visuals are only interacting with each other on the left side and on the right, only on the right. So if I was to uh, select something over here, do that. Uh, so let's look at our short lead time uh, cases. It's only going to change over here. So we see over here, we still are looking at our overall 29 days and 22 hours. And then if I want to do a benchmark, so the reason we have this page is for direct comparisons and then throwing some KPIs in here. So let's look at our long lead time ones. Um, now, right off the bat, we can see we're looking at a similar number of variants here. So let me do a little more. Um, but we can see that there's like some small differences in our short lead time uh, cases. But overall, they kind of follow the the approvals. Um, and you might skip one or two, but that's okay. 
And then it looks like sometimes you post a goods receipt and you don't actually post an invoice, which could be an issue. Um, but there's not a ton of variation. Whereas over here in our long lead time ones, we're seeing that, okay, wow, we've got some really red edges coming here. We've also got create purchase requisition coming in at the beginning, which we don't have over here, um, at least not very often. Um, and now we see that, okay, let's look at where we're getting our longest lead time pieces and we can see when we skip approval levels or when we just skip them entirely, um, we're getting really long lead times in this duration uh, bucket. So obviously I've handpicked it so that these um, were in the longer bucket, but this is how you would do a kind of comparison for anything. This is right now I'm looking at lead time comparisons, but if I wanted to do what I just said with um, your purchase organizations, um, your offices handling different regions, uh, maybe your different countries that you're shipping from. You can do all that stuff side by side right here. And that's really important for process mining because you may find that, um, you know, in the case of a branch handling a different region, maybe they have a more efficient process and it's something that you could actually adopt in other ones. And you'll find that out by selecting these two and you'll see, okay, really long lead time, really short lead time, what's different and you can compare. Um, additionally, I didn't mention this, I did say a couple KPIs, but we put the number of average process steps. So on average in your long bucket, your long lead time bucket, you have 7.31 process steps, you have 34 variants and 101 cases um, in your current data. And this is actually a really interesting comparison too, without looking at this. Um, you see 17 variants and 239 cases. So we have half as many variants for um, our shorter lead time cases and way more cases, double the cases. So this can be a conclusion um, that you could draw. This isn't true for every process, but maybe you find here that, okay, when we have more standardization in our process where we accomplish it the same way every time, it's showing us we do get results. We get shorter lead times on average. We have way less variance and way more cases going through these short lead times than we do here where we have um, double the variance in half the cases, which, you know, it's good that we have half the cases, but it also means that we're having a lot of unique variants probably in here. And if I want to look further at those unique variants, I can come to the next page. Um, so we have a section here that we always call our analysis section from variance to process steps. So I'll probably fly through a couple of these, but I'll try to linger on one or two of them because they're all going to be kind of standard power or sorry, standard process mining analysis. Um, but we'll begin here on the variance. And in the variance, um, there's a few things to notice. First, I'm going to start with this Pareto um, visual. And the Pareto visual is interesting because it's a statistical analysis on variance versus cases. So remember, variance are different ways that your process happens, they're process flows. Um, the Pareto statistical um, analysis, basically, you try to cover 80% uh, of something with 20% of an attribute. Uh, that's a general way of looking at it, but for process mining, a really common way to look at it is you want 20% of your variance to cover at least 80% of your cases, because that's showing you that you have a high rate of standardization because you have less variance than you have cases, obviously. Um, so here we're seeing that, okay, we have 14% of our variance covering over 80% of our cases. We've got a great start here. Um, it means we have a fairly standard process covering a lot of our, our cases. Um, and you can see that this green on the outside edge here goes into the interior as well. What this green is, is your 20% variance. So 13% variants are outside here. And then this interior part is the rest, the other, sorry, 14% is on the outside. And then the next 6%, accounting for your top 20% of variance, is right here too. So you're seeing that you're actually covering half of the leftover cases with the rest of your 20% variance. So you're actually probably getting uh, close to like 850 cases covered by just your top 20 variants, which is phenomenal. You know, that's great. You definitely want to see something like that. But the lower variants covering the more cases, probably the better as far as standardization goes. Um, so that's what that visual is about. Uh, there's also a new visual here with the root cause analyzer. This is just a statistical analysis thing. So um, in Power BI, we're just taking the cases. So um, all of our cases where something happened, and we're trying to give an attribute to it to explain by. So 
for example, right here, we're looking at our variants and we say, okay, I want to see my variants that have a ton of process steps, over six. So I'll select that. And now what this is doing is giving me a selection based off of what I've told it to explain by and trying to give me some statistical correlation uh, using coverage and precision to explain my data selection. So we see 80% here um, with a happy path, zero self loops, and a high automation, or sorry, a low automation rate. Um, but basically, it'll have different tabs creating different um, groupings of um, attributes to give you your analysis. And we can see that now we just have self loops versus here we're including a bunch of things. Um, and then if I keep going down, sometimes it's now it's just automation rate and here it's automation rate still. Um, so it'll break it down in that way. And as you go, it just gives you a lot of different options to explain your data. Um, if you also want to see this as a scatter plot person, if you're a scatter plot, sorry, if you want to see this as a scatter plot because you're a scatter plot person, you can click this button. There you go. Um, and then if you have a quick thought and you're saying, hmm, okay, I see that I have um, this for my high uh, process step variance. What about the rest of them? What about everything I didn't select? The root cause analyzer actually has a real nice thing here where you can just invert your selection. So now I'm looking at everything that I didn't select. Um, without actually going in control selecting that all because that would be a little um, cumbersome. Not the worst, but it would just be a little cumbersome. Um, and now we're seeing that for all the rest, when we have a self loop, uh, that's involved with lower process steps, which is an interesting thing to find out because maybe it's telling us something about our process. And then I did mention uh, unique variants earlier. Uh, we just have a quick button. This is just a tree map that we put kind of made into a bit of a a button. Um, so if you wanted to look at your unique variants, first of all, you can hover and you can see you have 29 of them. Um, and you can see they all do one case. And now you can see your distribution of um, what the process average number of process steps is. So we can see 18 out of our 29 unique variants have greater than six process steps. And then we see the rest are displayed throughout here. Um, and then the root cause analyzer. Again, this is going to give you an ex a possible explanation for your data. We see a strength of 35% for um, create purchase requisi requisition, uh, self loop, and low automation rate. The loops page is going to be really similar to what I just showed you, just like some slightly different stuff where we'll see a KPI where your what your lead time looks like when you have self loops in your case versus not, um, what your how many self loops you had uh, over time, so how many new cases have self loops. And you'll notice one real quick thing here that we can also have a node highlight on here. This can be really good for process mining. If you're not interested as much in the time between activities, maybe you're interested in some attribute related to the activity specifically, um, you can feed the process explorer or something so that you can highlight by that. So here we're seeing that Postgres receipt is really, really red because it has a ton of self loops. So our automation page is not about necessarily accomplishing automation, even though it might help you accomplish that goal. Um, the automation page is a lot of it is about understanding your automation efforts in the past. So what we have here is your automation rate in your cases um, over time. So you're seeing how many of your cases uh, are highly automated. Here we're seeing what our most automated steps are. We can see Postgres receipt is automated. Um, a thousand times, over a thousand times. So it's just giving us some nice looks at, okay, have I successfully uh, automated my process over time? And here we're saying, okay, for at least this data set, no, we're not automating. We're actually getting worse over time with our automation. And then you see your average automation rate up here. The lead times page, um, I'll stick on here just a little longer, but it's not going to be too different from a lot of the stuff we've seen. Um, you'll have a grouping of your lead times. Um, so this is just your different buckets for uh, lead times. It's what I used earlier, that group duration. Um, you've got your overall average lead time still up here. This is the same as before, 29 days, 22 hours. Um, and then we again use the bookmark feature of Power BI to actually bring in a new thing, which is a lead time calculator. So when we're going through a process, uh, you might want to look at the average lead time over the whole thing, right? You want to know beginning to end, how long does it take? But sometimes you want to know just how long it takes between two steps, regardless of what's between them. So 
Here I can see on average between approved PO level one and postcode's receipt, if I put nothing else in between, it takes 11 days and five hours on average. If I was to actually click approved PO level one, so let me click that, click off here, and then do postcode's receipt. Now what it's telling me is this part right here is included in the data, but so is here where we're going uh, to other steps first before we get to postcode's receipt. So now we're seeing that when we include this part along with this part, we're seeing eight days and 15 hours, nine minutes and two seconds on average to go from approved PO level one to post goods receipt. So this is just for breaking up and slicing your uh, process in different ways, but it can be really, really handy if you want to see just how long it takes from go to, to go from one step of the process to the other, regardless of what's in between the, those two steps. The process steps page is our last analysis page. Again, I'm not going to spend long on this one. Um, it's just giving you an idea of how, what the average number of process steps per case, um, process step types per case. So this is basically just telling you you have 6.05 unique process uh, steps per case on average. Um, this is telling you your total number of process steps, which uh, can be interesting, but sometimes it's not. And then down here, we've just grouped it so you can understand when you start with a specific activity, are you leading to more and more process steps? Um, so when we start with create purchase requisition, we see that we have a lot of process steps in the, the rest of the case uh, on average. And then here you can just see um, the average number of events in cases, including this activity and approved PL level one or one, two and three, all those things. It's just a little node attribute there. Uh, I'm not going to go into this page one. That's just a page that I've been working on uh, some other stuff with. But uh, compliance analysis. So this is um, probably the last like of a really big bunch of uh, interesting visuals for Power BI or sorry for process mining. Um, there is something interesting in conformance checking too. But here we have an event uh, filter. So we we call it the event filter. Basically what this lets you do is if you want to see a specific process and you don't want to go through the, the uh, process of including and excluding and filtering all that thing, say you just want, you know exactly what you want to see and you want to find out how many cases go through that flow. What I can actually do is come here and start building that flow and I can say, okay, I want to see when it does all these different things and I want to see only my cases that have post negative goods receipt. Um, but what I can also do is click this. So right now it is uh, a dotted line. If I click it, then it's solid, and this red axis acting as our start node. It's I'm now denoting to this that I want these cases to start with create purchase order. If I clicked down here, what I'm telling it now is I want it to end with post negative goods receipt. And as you can see, this turned into a yellow exclamation mark. That's just telling us that no cases follow this flow that I've. Uh, put here. So if I want this, then I'm saying I want to go want it to go directly from create purchase order to approve PL level one. If I leave the dotted line, I'm saying anything can come between these two. I could have any number of steps between create PO and approve PL level one. So if I keep doing this, it looks like we don't have anything, but if I do that and now I'll filter. And now we will take a look and we see we have four variants in six cases that have this um, process flow with there might be steps in between these things or at the end here, but that's what we're seeing uh, now. So I click, I remember uh, if you ever use this, I have to click the um, green check mark to make sure that it actually filters the page. And now we have another new visual, which is the case viewer. And the case viewer uh, is the kind of the inverse of the process explorer instead of looking at a variant view where we're looking at all the process flows we're looking each case one by one by one so we see case one two three and so on and so forth here um, and they're just laid out right here horizontally without getting interfered with each other um, additionally you'll also notice that we don't have self loop indicators because we have approved PL level one right back to approved PL level one the idea of the case viewer is to give you a really, really explicit look at your process side by side. Um, so you're just going case by case. And this is really good for when you start to drill down into your data. Um, and one other thing it's good for is if I add the resource into the legend. 
Now you'll notice that we've got a bunch of different uh, colors going on. If I click this, you'll see that we actually see the uh, anonymized resource numbers that accomplished each step. So if I go farther on this one, you'll see, OK, they handed it off to C2 and then we got to 3CF um, and so on and so forth until we finish the process. So this is really good for a couple of things. Um, you can use it for seeing your handoffs. So you just see who's interacting with who the most. Um, you can also use it, though, for potentially an auditing perspective where you see, um, OK, I'm seeing the same color through all these approval levels right here. So on this this golden color, um, maybe potentially you're saying, OK, no one should be doing all of the approval levels themselves. That's not how we're supposed to be running things. Maybe you've now found something to go talk to someone and say, hey, please don't do this again or uh, what happened here, like explain it to us. Um, and that's really nice just being able to have those, we call them swim lanes, and just uh, take a look at how your process flows. And you don't just have to do resource here. Uh, if you did have something else like department, so you have like purchasing department, then uh, you know, like shipping or warehouse department for when you get your goods receipt, um, you know, you could see how that flow goes as well. Um, it doesn't just have to be resource, that's just the one I like to use there. OK, so we'll be on our last page here, and this is where we'll finish the demo. Um, again, over here we have the event filter. It's just kind of vertical now. Um, and we have one last feature of the Process Explorer, and this is conformance checking. So let me click off. Um, there's a button in the top right. I don't want to hover over it because it'll get covered, but that button right there is how you activate conformance checking. So if I click it, I'll be back to our regular view. And now I'm back to conformance checking. And what conformance checking is, is you specify a process flow that you want to see, and now it'll mark it as green. And anything that's not that process flow is going to be red. So this is how you might doing, do a little bit of um, auditing of your process as a general thing. Um, you want to see how often your process is conforming to what you want to see. And every time you see red, you're going to say, OK, that's not what I wanted to see. Um, and just as a couple features, you can click this here and we can see what we specified to be our conforming model. Um, and I can mark as con not conforming from here. So now I've said, OK, there's a couple things I don't want to see. If I go back, now we see there's more red than there was before. Um, if I wanted to, let's say, grab the top three variants and say all of these are OK, I could grab them all and then um, click this thumbs up and now they're all part of my model. If I go here, you'll see that. Um, on the other end, if I just wanted to grab one and make sure I said that it wasn't, I could just click the uh, thumbs down. And you may have noticed this uh, yellow going on. <clears throat> so what the yellow is, is model moves. Uh, model moves are basically just, if you take a look at our process, our conforming process, this is telling us what we want it to do. So when we have create purchase order, we want it to go to at least one approval level. So that's why it's giving us this red because we see it's being uh, no approval levels are happening and now we're seeing that's not conforming. Um, and this is just telling you this is what should have happened. Uh, it, it didn't in these cases, but that's what you wanted. And you can always turn that off if it starts cluttering you. Um, it's definitely not. Uh, required to have it on, but sometimes it's nice just to know where you went wrong and what you did want to see if you get a little caught up. Yeah, so that's going to conclude my demo. Um, I hope you learned a lot about process mining, especially in Power BI. Um, there's a lot that goes beyond behind this. Um, Daniel touched on it a bit, but if you want to explore a little bit more about uh, process mining, obviously this will talk about PathNow specifically, but if you want to come to our docs, there's still a lot in there that is not about path now and is just about process mining in general. Um, for example, the event log page here, there's going to give you a good example of what you need um, in order to get to this point. Um, and for the free visual that Daniel is going to show you in a little bit, these are the three fields that you're going to need. So if you want to um, use that free visual, make sure to come to the docs, come to the event log page and uh, read up on this a little bit, and then you'll be good to go with the free visual. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to conclude this here. Uh, we may have had questions, but I'll let Daniel tell me if there's anything I need to answer. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. I think we got all the questions answered in the chat. Um, if there's any more, go ahead and add those. I will 
bring back up my screen real quick here, give you some contact info. Uh, if you go to bit.ly forward slash free visual, that'll take you right to Microsoft App Source and you can download um, the process discovery visual, um, use it for free as long as you want. And it's one of the things that we provide at no charge into Power BI. If you have questions, you can reach out to me by email or, uh, you know, please connect on LinkedIn. I, I post a lot of stuff there, um, articles and, and uh, whatnot. So let's connect there and, and continue the conversation.